Hello and welcome to this presentation on land restoration assessment and monitoring a risk-based approach. I'm Keith Shepherd from the World Agroforestry Centre where I lead our science domain on land health decisions. <clears throat> land restoration is a very topical subject presently. There are a number of different global initiatives aimed uh, at restoring land at scale. We have the Sustainable Development Goal 15, of course, the Bond Challenge, land degradation neutrality as a concept from the UNCCD, <clears throat> the 4 per mil um, initiative to increase soil carbon, the 20 by 20 initiative and the Africa Forest Landscape Restoration Initiative. These are just some examples that show the magnitude of commitment and interest to land restoration. But we remain highly uncertain on how much land is degraded and where, and estimates of degraded land range from anything below 6% of land area to uh, more than 40%. So with this uncertainty, uh, we are challenged to uh, make progress on how to measure um, where we are and, uh, and our progress towards achieving uh, these goals. We have been working on a framework called Land Health Surveillance and Response, which attempts to address uh, some of these difficulties. Uh, we define land health as the capacity of land to sustain ecosystem services, and our definition of land health surveillance is modelled closely on public health surveillance uh, to develop and promote methods for measuring and monitoring land health, assessing risks and targeting interventions. Uh, we've published uh, this framework which provides a review of, of surveillance science uh, in agricultural systems last year. If we look at a surveillance framework used in public health, we'll see that we're very far from achieving the kind of scientific rigour uh, achieved in public health when we come to looking at land health and degradation. Uh, we are not using probabilistic sampling frames. We don't have clear case definitions on what's degraded. Rapid screening tests, we really don't know the dose-response relationships between uh, risk factors and, and degradation. Um, we, risk modeling and forecasting is even unheard of. Um, and uh, we see very little intervention cost-effective anal analysis. Um, so we have a long way to go uh, in, in introducing that rigour. <clears throat> the reason we think focusing on the lessons in public health surveillance is there are many common features of land health with public health. Um, in public health there are problems in defining what's a normal case and uh, um, a, a degraded state, particularly say in mental health. Um, problems are associated with a range of biological, social and economic risk factors and those risk factors are often interrelated and act together to cause uh, problems. Uh, risk factors are often separated from outcomes in time by many decades and different stakeholder groups perceive risks very differently. These are all common problems to, to human health and land health. So what we've done is to borrow surveillance science principles from public health and apply them to land health. So one of the principles is to focus on populations, um, the health of populations, and use proper sampling designs so we can make inferences back to a whole population, whether that's a country or a given area, area under a given crop. Uh, we can talk about the prevalence and incidence of problems given that we've used the sampling frame standardized protocols, um, case definitions, rapid screening tests, and quantification of risk factors using risk models, and lastly, cost-effectiveness analysis. We've uh, worked on methods to try and apply these principles uh, to land health, um, particularly through the Africa Soil Information Service, where we have laid down a sampling scheme, a probability sampling scheme at sub-Saharan Africa scale, with 60 sentinel sites, uh, randomized, uh, uh, stratified according to climate zone. And then each of these 10 by 10 kilometer sites um, have a number of sample points given in red there, which are about 30 meters across, 1,000 meters squared, where systematic measurements of vegetation um, are made and soil samples are taken on a, a, a standardized sampling scheme. 
And then we use um, sol infrared spectroscopy as a rapid and low cost measurement and highly reproducible measurement of sol properties. Armed with these ground measurements, georeference ground measurements, uh, we can now model uh, those observations back up to remote sensing layers and map out uh, soil properties and constraints on a continuous basis across the target area. It also allows us to comment on the prevalence of different problems uh, at that scale. Uh, so you can see the different principles of surveillance are carried through in, into, this, uh, into this method. Currently, uh, we find that many governments are interested in not, uh, not mapping perhaps the whole country, but mainly focusing on the cropped area. So we, AFSIS, have developed a geo-survey tool which presents users with uh, randomized images, uh, which you score, uh, for example, for the presence of cropland. By doing this on many thousands of um, images, uh, we can then develop models against remote sensing imagery that can accurately map out now, uh, for instance, the, the cultivated areas of Tanzania. And you can see from the receiver operator curve about 90% accuracy in doing this. And consistently we find people uh, are surprised uh, where the croplands are when, when we do this. That provides us a target population for us to now sample. So we have all the uh, programs and scripts and so on to generate automatically uh, sampling plans which allow you to go uh, to the field. This is an example of uh, maize sorghum uh, areas mapped in, in Nigeria uh, under the Africa Soil Information Service. And so these are clusters where we send our field teams to take the soil samples. But we don't go further than that. We also randomize our agronomic trials uh, onto the sample frames so that we can also take unbiased uh, measurements of crop response to fertilizer, for instance, and management and make inferences uh, from that back to the whole area and even map uh, fertilizer responses uh, over the whole area. <clears throat> um, what is key to, to be able to work at these scales efficiently is uh, the, the spectroscopy technology. Um, I run the uh, Soil Plant Spectral Diagnostics Lab at the World Agroforestry Center we have a number of different types of instruments, but we've boiled much of it down to just two um, instruments that can run off battery packs that don't require stable electricity. Uh, on the left is a mid-infrared spectrometer, which we mainly use for soil analysis. And on the right is a handheld X-ray fluorescence uh, analyzer, which we use for uh, plant tissue analysis. Uh, coupling the two together, uh, we can get an excellent picture of uh, the basic soil properties and uh, what the plant is doing in terms of macro and micronutrients. Um, we can also uh, use these techniques to measure the quality of organic resources and certify uh, fertilizer quality, uh, as well as heavy metal uh, pollution. <clears throat> what we are seeing with these infrared spectra, which is the amount of light absorbed in different wavelength bands, uh, these are spectra of many different soils. Um, these spectra relate to the mineral composition or organic composition of soils, which in turn um, really um, produce uh, most soil functional properties. So it's giving us a fingerprint, um, if you like, of soil functional property, which for a dollar a sample uh, in 30 seconds you can um, get very easily. We have other technology, uh, in this case laser diffraction particle size analysis, where we measure the dynamically the change in particle size as soils break up um, in water, uh, applying energy, which allows us to look at aggregate stability and um, the soil erodibility. And you can see in the bottom right here how we can begin to define thresholds um, for soil organic carbon. Uh, below which soils start to disperse and, and break up. So above 1.5% carbon, we see soils are, are reasonably stable. <clears throat> um, we're currently using this spectral application, spectral methodology in many applications, uh, fertilizer and soil management interventions, for soil carbon inventory, for soil health baselines in development projects, uh, we think this can provide um, soil testing services for small to farmers at uh, much lower prices. Um, we're working with the World Bank Living Standards Measurement Study and Conservation International on long-term uh, soil monitoring initiatives. 
Um, this is the, the, re the real way to do evidence-based agronomy by uh, coupling soil and plant analysis on uh, multi-location trials put on probability samples. Um, and as I mentioned, product quality control, uh, as well as characterizing things like mine reclamation sites in terms of both soil fertility and heavy metal uh, problems. We also test uh, new spectroscopy instruments, and we're always all the time looking for smaller and cheaper uh, instruments that could be used uh, in the field. We support um, spectral laboratories now in over 10 African countries, many of them with national institutions. Uh, and this network is growing and actually uh, stretches from Peru to China now. <clears throat> As an example, um, we've also helped the Ethiopian government uh, map uh, various con soil constraints, um, here pH of cropland topsoils, uh, to allow them to target their fertilizer import and um, blending strategies, for example. Uh, through the ISRIC, the World Soil Information Service, who've collected up um, soil legacy profile data from Africa and combined that with our, our new data sets, they're able to now map soil properties at 250 meter resolution over the tower of Africa. And this provides you a good um, first estimate of what to expect in a, in a given area. And so, for example, we can map out a crop predicted lime requirement for uh, croplands and you can see uh, it's not such an unmanageable uh, problem. I want to turn now to uh, from what we've shown is a way to measure uh, land degradation and get baselines on degradation and he land health and a way to make repeated measures and revisit measures to see what is changing but that is still quite expensive and um, um, requires um, resources and patience. But if we look at the public health sector again, uh, much of the surveillance has actually shifted onto the risk factors associated with health problems. So if we see in this framework we have our final outcomes such as soil fertility decline, um, which are, are caused by various processes like soil and nutrient stock depletion, but these are associated with what we call proximal causes or proximal risk factors, the immediate factors which um, um, precipitate those problems, for example no low nutrient input use, but those in turn are linked to a set of more distal uh, drivers or risk factors such as uh, poverty for example, and there's a, an interconnected set of, of these risk factors. Um, most rehabilitation uh, measures will act more on the, the downstream side at the proximal um, causes, whereas preventive measures will tend to work um, more upstream towards the, the distal causes. But a really important tenet uh, from preventive medicine, which I think is fundamental to the way we look at land degradation, is that Typically, only a few risk uh, factors account for most of the disease or land degradation burden. And if we want to reduce the future burden of um, land degradation, we should be looking to reduce the average levels of these risk factors uh, in the whole population. Um, for example, if we take the problem with uh, heart disease, um, one of the biggest risk factors is high blood pressure. Now the way to reduce future um, heart disease is not to keep treating the people at the high end of the curve by giving tablets to people with high blood pressure. Obviously you don't want to stop doing that, but the real secret is to bring down the, the, the blood pressure levels in the whole population. So if you see these top curves, the distributions of blood pressure shifting to the left as we bring down the blood pressure in the whole population through things like better diet and exercise and so on. And if you see in the bottom uh, graph here, um, the uh, population with high blood pressure um, now is dramatically decreasing uh, as we shift those curves downwards. So this requires uh, very different strategies, uh, population-wide strategies uh, of prevention. Um, and it also requires monitoring, uh, a different level of monitoring. Now we're monitoring the risk factors um, rather than the outcomes. 
and uh, this could lead to very different kinds of interventions. Uh, these could be um, public uh, policies to encourage better um, behavioral patterns, for example, to achieve this. And I think when we apply this to land degradation, it may take us to very different types of intervention than we've been considering so far. What we've tended to do is to identify and map land degradation hotspots and then target um, interventions to rehabilitate those areas. But these are costly and difficult and failures are common. Um, what we're arguing for is really what I call a portfolio approach, which is a mix of preventive, restorative and rehabilitative uh, in interventions. Uh, the preventive measures need to target risk factors at a population level, and that could be at a national level or over the entire croplands, for example. And uh, we need to be looking for interventions that operate on the distal factors, incentives for more sustainable land management practice, for example, to, to achieve this. If we give some examples of proximal risk factors uh, for land degradation, um, I mean, first we really need to define what is our desired state I and mean, what do we want landscapes to look like um, and what pro proximal factors prevent uh, us attaining those desired states. So if we look at rangelands, we know overgrazing and woody encroachments are example of, of proximal risk factors. Um, on croplands, cropping of la marginal land, inadequate soil conservation and so on. Um, we can very well define the, the key risk factors. Um, and so now we need to be asking you know, what are the distal drivers of these proximal factors and how can they be influenced. So we may have a series now of strategies, both preventive and rehabilitative, but we need to make choices about what is the most effective. And here we have developed a framework which is um, what I call economic analysis plus plus because it's a lot more than an economic analysis and it's based on, on decision sciences. So we need to make choices between a, a range of intervention strategies that uh, a government may be or development program is considering investing in. And so what we do is to identify um, all of the costs, the benefits and risks associated with those interventions. However, difficult or seemingly difficult they, they may be to measure. Um, we put probability distributions on everything and we combine both available data and expert knowledge to create uh, these economic models um, or impact pathways if you like. And uh, this allows us to generate uh, probability distributions of outcomes, for example net present value and by uh, studying these, we can see what is it that is um, leading to the possibility of negative outcomes and already try to design in um, uh, improvements to uh, reduce those risks. We can look at uh, cash flows over time and the uncertainties of those. But more importantly, um, by putting probability distributions on everything and including everything, everything that we think is important, we can calculate the value of information so we can tell you uh, where do you need to go and get more information or make further measurements to be able to make a better decision. And experience has shown that you know, often those areas are not where people expect and uh, often one needs less information and data than, than one first thinks. So by uh, using these decision analytic tools uh, we can generate enormous value in terms of making better choices of uh, intervention options. Furthermore, um, by looking at where the uncertainties are and the risks are, we can design better monitoring schemes because we can see where are things more likely to go wrong that has a big effect on outcomes and those are the areas that we should be monitoring carefully during implementation. And at the same time we are accumulating evidence down an impact pathway of um, what, whether things are really lining up with the way we expect and therefore creating a learning tool for ourselves. We have uh, published these uh, approaches and uh, a way forward in terms of the methods uh, in a nature comment article and uh, various blogs and we have developed a number of tools to help with this kind of analysis and we have a, an active uh, working group on that. 
So in summary, uh, we need to be taking a more holistic um, outlook on the whole land restoration agenda in terms of looking at um, not only measuring the outcomes, the land degradation, but also paying close attention to what are the risk factors, both proximal and, and distal risk factors of land degradation, um, coming up with balanced portfolios of intervention and uh, um, restorative um, actions, um, evaluating those through cost-effectiveness uh, uh, evaluation um, or cost-benefit or risk-return analysis, um, and then tracking those through with time to um, see whether our assumptions are holding up. And uh, we feel this will be a lot more uh, mature framework um, for approaching the, the whole restoration uh, agenda. Um, thank you for your attention and I, I hope we'll be able to take some questions.